Welcome and good morning. How are you doing? We're going to be talking about Melchizedek Communion today. And uh, I'm really excited about this. And I'm looking forward to sharing with you more about communion. Melchizedek was the first one to give communion. So I think we can learn a lot from that. Good morning, Tracy. How are you doing? How are you doing? I wanted to read a little bit to you while people are coming on and I hope sharing sharing the links with your friends. And while we're doing that, I wanted to read to you. Now, if you are just wanting to get to the lesson, it will be in 10 minutes. Like the exhausted followers upon the stormy lake, this is from Hole and Holy. Like the exhausted followers upon that stormy lake, we weary of contending with the dark waves of, of adversity. The one who calms every storm teaches us to persevere until we can command our own storms to cease. The waves may be over our head, but faith cannot be stolen. As with the ebb and flow of good times and beds, eventually storms end. They can't move us from our course. Through it all, our authority perfects itself as we yield to his dealings. So keep in mind, the worst storms always come before the biggest victories. But there can be peace within, and there's always something waiting on the other side. And even the apostles were ill-prepared for what was waiting. They couldn't see in the dusk, but Jesus could. Then finally, in the morning light, the exhausted travelers were finally able to see. And it was a steep cliff. Yuck, you can almost hear their complaints. Well, I don't like it. It's too high, too cold, too far. Oh, it sounds too familiar. What is that? You're getting the picture. It's not tranquil on this side either. Yes, the Gadarene awaited. The worst growler packed, demonically depressed person that's ever been described in the Bible. The whole city feared this lunatic with a legion of demons, and they didn't know what to do with him. Suddenly, that violent storm brought the disciples to the hopelessly insane man who soon became miraculously healed and transformed. And more difficult still, the once terrified townspeople later furiously demanded that Jesus leave town. It didn't make any sense, but they didn't like the results. Why? Well, this region raised pigs, and their livelihood just ran over the cliff. The destruction of their whole economic base caused them to forget the miracle, and this was serious. The result of that great miracle was that once again the disciples were hated. The ultimate realization discloses that the hopeless Gadarene, the chained person living in the tomb, well, it was me. I'm the Gadarene. Inside that mausoleum, memory silently breathes as nearby worms and spiders approach my face. Within my carnal soul that clings to the spirit of death, crawls legions of thoughts that entrap me with webs. The ghosts of my carnal soul haunt me and wicked traits of my dead self nature arise. Finally, I surrender totally to Jesus and suddenly he journeys with me from that isolated cemetery to a place of self-discovery. How did he know how much I needed him to come and cross over to the other side? Then he sets me free from that hopelessness. I died with him, but I'm not dead anymore. He rolled away my tombstone. And I, stepping into the brightest daylight, watches the veils of blindness drop from my eyelids. Like the weighty cobwebs that were once strewn in the musty corners of my shrine, they now detach and fall forever and freedom pulses her strong cadence, and I can hear the birds singing their resurrection morning song. Winter is past and gone, 
and summer is coming. And I see the Lord extend his hand to me and say, come away with me. The reasons are clear. He caused me to cross over in order to fully deliver me from the crypt of my own making. I walk out to find the road winds up from here among the hills to that great city. And without regret, I leave the colorless, barren desert behind and advance into the gentle purple meadow slope that are lit by vibrant yellow-green daylight. And life explodes with fulfillment, moving full tilt into my heart. So what we see is the journey of crossing over develops godly character and sets me free. Good morning. Oh, I want to talk a lot more about crossing over. So I thought that was a good uh, portion to read. Good morning, Paul. Deborah. Good morning, Jenna. Selena. Sean. Tracy. I'm so glad to see you guys. Leonard. Candace. Pam. Rodell. Candace. Shante. Colleen. Thea. L.A., my goodness, Paula, I think I have all of you here. Good to see you guys. It's great to, Jenna, good morning. Good morning. How are we all persevering? You know, we're all crossing over. That is um, my book, um, Whole and Holy. For those of you that were with me in Guam, I was writing this while, at the end of while I was there, and it kind of was what we had been studying all along at the time. You were in Exodus all day yesterday. Cynthia, Thea, Donna Renee, good morning, good morning. We, uh, have to see that we are crossing over. Uh, Cindy Cox wrote to me the other day and said, remember when you taught about crossing over in Guam? And, and so I thought, well, that's a really good thing that we could review here because we, of all times in our life, we really are crossing over into a new day. Things will not be the same after the quarantine as they have that as they were before, you know, things are going to change. They must change. If we go back to the same way that they were, then we haven't learned anything, have we? We just haven't learned anything from the quarantine. If we go back and act just like we did before it started. Selena, good to see you. Good morning, Donna. Cynthia. It, it, it's, um, it's, Important that we know that the quarantine isn't teaching us anything, but what we learn is to overcome it. We uh, God isn't sending the quarantine to teach us something, but we learn how to overcome and we learn how to be victorious. Is that right? Because we are moving forward in spite of it. There's nothing that is stopping us from the success we need to find. Margie, good morning. Good morning. Things must change. We must come into a new place. For dignity prosper. Shalom, shalom. Good morning. There is a time that we must understand we're in. And I, I'm going to say this every time. It is not the end time. This is not the end times. We have to, we have to, uh, we have to understand that the end times that the Bible was talking about was the end of an era, and that was in A.D. 57 through 60 to 70. And all those prophecies came to pass. It was the end of an era, the end of a an epoch. But every single one of those t prophecies has come to pass. We can't apply that to now because it's not talking about now. It was talking about this generation shall not pass away until all these things come to pass. So be assured, 
don't give up and have a passive viewpoint on life thinking that this is the end because this is only the end if you believe it is. But it can be the beginning for all of us. Is that right? Praise God. Deborah, Tracy, praise God. Yes, I, I, I love your little faces over there. It's 11-11, and it's time for us to begin our communion. And oh my goodness, I am so excited to be with you today. I'm so blessed to be a part of this most essential time of taking communion and understanding what that is. We had talked earlier about the scripture in Hebrews that says that the ceremonial regulations applied until this time and there must come a new order. And we understand that that new order was supposed to begin and, and it is beginning. And it's time for a new order of things to come into place right now. And in the beginning, God is, is initiated a priesthood called Melchizedek. It was from the beginning. But the Levitical priesthood came in later and replaced it because of a lack of understanding. Then in Hebrews 7, it says, the priesthood has changed. And in Hebrews, we must understand that we are not living under the Levitical system anymore, but that God changed the priesthood back to what it was originally, which was Melchizedek. And the Lord wants us to not live in a Levitical system. He doesn't want us to worship in a Levitical system or to live under the law or to be uh, guided by legalism. So Jesus reinstated his royal priesthood, which was Melchizedek. Erica, good morning. How are you, Cindy? Good to see you. Today's your birthday. All right. So I want to talk to you then about this new order. This It's a crossing over into a new order that we continue to need to bring forward. Because if you're looking at your life and your worship as Levitical, then we're missing the point that we haven't crossed over into the new priesthood that we're supposed to be living in. And then fortunately, so many people uh, do practice Levitical pract uh, rituals, and they're quite beautiful in some ways, but they are restrictive and legalistic. <clears throat> so all the Hebrew words are built on, sorry, excuse me, <coughs> they're built on pictures. The Hebrew words are more like pictures. The Greek words are abstract concepts. The Hebrew words are pictures. And we see that Abraham, good morning, Erica and, Tra and Terry. We, we see in Cynthia, <laughs> we see that Abraham initially was a moon worshiper and he lived in the land of Ur. Ur. Now, I have written a lot about, uh, I thought I had the book here, but I guess I don't. I've written a lot about uh, Abraham and Melchizedek uh, extensively. And I'm just giving you a little tiny piece of that book. But it is one of the most fascinating studies. It's not something that you can just read one, one day, sit down and read. It's something that you would have to study. Pat Joyce, thank you for being here. Praise God. Terry, Erica, Sharon. Good morning, good morning. So we're talking about Abraham. And I hope you get the book and you can get it on my site or you can get it on Amazon. And, and the book has two different covers. So you can pick whichever cover you want. It's the same book inside. But it studies about Melchizedek in detail. 
and who that is and why that's important to us. So we have Abraham, and he was, a, he was a moon worshiper. He was not a believer, but God selected him and had him travel to a new land. With, and he was supposed to go by himself, but he didn't. He took his brother and his father and all of his family and everything he owned, and he, and he, and he moved forward into this place. And, and here they were, they traveled and traveled, and I just love the fact that they traveled to get to a tree. I, I just think that's pretty interesting. <laughs> but anyway, after a, a while, Lot moved into Sodom and got into a lot of trouble. You remember that. And Abraham had to uh, rescue him because Lot was taken away from from Sodom by um, some kings and and a great war ensued and there were 10 kings and they were fighting and fighting and I write a lot about that it's just fascinating and uh, this great war happened but and Abraham had never been a warrior never been a soldier but he took like 316 men out to the valley of Siddim and he started fighting because he wanted to rescue his brother. And he, somehow against all these kings who were fighting each other, Abraham got in and, and rescued his brother. And Abraham took with him a lot of, of um, proceeds from the war. He, ha he was loaded with the 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 riches of the kings that he had won over. And, and so he was victorious and he was going, Abraham is going home uh, with a huge bounty of, of riches and jewelry and gold and all these things. And he's taking his brother home and, and they're going home. And of course they meet in the road, they meet Melchizedek and the king of Sodom. And that in itself is a, a story that I just absolutely love. But I want to just get back to the thing that about him meeting Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek was established before the Le Le Levitical system came into place. And let's just read what the scripture says when he met Melchizedek there. He says, then... Melchizedek, king of Salem, this is when they met, brought out bread and wine, and he was the priest of God Most High. And Melchizedek blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. In, the, in that short verse, there is so much for us to gain. But I'm just wanting to extract what they're talking about with communion today. But I hope you get the book so that we can get the idea of what was important here. He was a priest of the Most High God. That's El Elyon. And he was appointed by God. Where the Levitical priests were appointed by men, the Melchizedek priesthood was appointed by God. And, and a priest, we know, met, uh, mediates between God and the subjects, and he intercedes. But this priesthood was superior. Now, we've lost so much truth about Melchizedek during the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages. But what we want to get to here is this is the first mention of uh, communion and the symbols in communion. And here we have again the bread and the wine. Isn't that just so amazing? In, in the earliest part of the Old Testament, we're seeing communion instituted. And it prefigured what Jesus brought. But what I want you to see is that... Here is Abraham, and he's coming in victoriously. 
with all the proceeds from war and with his brother. And when he met Melchizedek, he was celebrating in victory. And so Melchizedek comes and blesses him. Blessed be Abraham of the God Most High. And, and we all know that this prefigures how Jesus was the bread that came from heaven. And unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. That's in John 6. So it's the same. We're seeing the same symbols used in both stories. So the priest of the Most High God blessed Abraham. And we know from Galatians that we are inheritors of Abraham's blessing. Right? So, so Melchizedek says, Blessed be Abraham of the God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. I can't even comprehend that scripture because according to the literal Greek, that blessing is that Abraham would be the possessor of heaven and earth. Abraham is the possessor of heaven and earth. And that is the promise that Abraham generationally passed down. The blessing of Melchizedek upon Abraham was that he would possess heaven and earth, that his progeny, that the people that were came from him would 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 be the people who possess heaven and earth. Now, uh, Vine says that the word blessing means to cause to prosper, to make happy, to bestow favor, to concentrate, to make holy purpose, to make successful, to make prosperous in temporal terms pertaining to this life and to guard and preserve. So it wasn't just a blessing of heaven in the future, in the sweet by and by, but Melchizedek, the priest of the Most High God, El Elyon, blessed Abraham. Are you with me? This is phenomenal. This is phenomenal. Blessed him with the blessing to be the possessor of heaven and earth. And, and then he sealed the blessing Melchizedek sealed the blessing with bread and wine. It was a transfer of favor. The blessing was words spoken. The blessing was words that were spoken by the Melchizedek, who was the priest and the king. He was a priest king. And the blessing was sealed with the communion that he had brought with him to give to Abraham. So Abraham was set apart by this blessing and entered into divine covenant. Romans says it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world through the righteousness that comes through faith. It was not through the law because it was before the law that Abraham received the promise that he would be heir of the world. Do you understand? Can we even comprehend what it means to be the heir of the world and how much we have to gain here? If we can begin to understand what this ha means to us. This now, this communion was to commemorate this great victory of Abraham rescuing his brother. But even King David knew about Melchizedek, and he said, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So during this exchange, during this exchange, there was a two way covenant here. Abraham encountered him. He chose between Melchizedek and the king of Sodom. And he chose Melchizedek. So this we are seeing that Abraham is turning to the Lord. 
he, this moon worshiper is is receiving the the kingdom promises of the Lord. And it's so both parties are receiving a blessing. And and just like Melchizedek brought out the bread and the wine, so did Jesus to commemorate his victory. C communion is about victory. Oh, I just love this. It's about what was accomplished on the cross, but Jesus is not on the cross. We need to get our eyes off the cross and put our minds on the chair because Jesus is sitting down. Jesus is sitting down. He's not on the cross anymore. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Now the response to the victory over the kings and receiving communion with Melchizedek was that Abraham made a decision. And, it, and that was that he tithed. Now don't get mad at me. This is what happened. Abraham, because of a blessing, tithed. It had nothing to do with guilt and control. It had nothing to do with condemnation. It had all to do with, I'm blessed, and, I, and, and you have blessed me, and I want to give to you. This is the very first mention of tithing. We see that tithing is not just under the law, but the initial idea of tithing was a blessing of receiving abundance and victory. The initial idea of tithing was because uh, of a consequence of communion, of intersecting with God. I saw this as a is not just taking bread and wine as communion, but communing with God. Abraham communed with God. And because he understood then who El Elyon was the most high, he tithed. He tithed out of victory. He tithed out of spoils. He tithed out of being so excited about this exchange in his life where everything changed. And I see here that you're asking about Melchizedek, was he Jesus? And that's what my book is about. And it's long, long conversation about was he Jesus or was he Shem? And there's evidence to prove both points, but it's very interesting. So we have to see here that <clears throat> there was a lot involved and it was an incredible amount of of uh, exchange here because of blessing, yes, because of the blessing Abraham tithed. We are, we have to leave this old order of tithing because we have to. I don't have to tithe to keep the windows of heaven open because the windows are open for me. Right? Jesus opened the windows of heaven. They never closed again. And I don't have to tithe to keep the windows open. I don't have to tithe to keep the devourer from me because Jesus did that for me. But I need to remember the Melchizedek idea that we give out of victory. We give out of a response to blessing and a response to communion. And so, so let us go then enter into this time together to take communion because you're a Melchizedek priest and I'm a Melchizedek priest. And this is something we don't have to gain. You are already a Melchizedek priest. There is no striving in this. And there's no hierarchical structure. We are all the same in terms of being Melchizedek priest. There is no one big Melchizedek priest over another we are all Melchizedek priests. It st stops at unity. It stops at equality. We are all Melchizedek priests. But as a priest under Melchizedek, I want to present a blessing to you and a communion. And I say, blessed are you. You're an inheritor of all that God has given. 
You're an inheritor of heaven and earth. Blessed are you. Blessed are you with health and with, and with victory. And we are one body that is made up of many parts. And each person is equally a Melchizedek priest. So taking this bread affirms or identifies us with the priesthood of Christ. Isn't that just incredible? So take your bread. And understand, this is the bread of life that is given to me because I am in koinonia with others in the body of Christ. There is no striving because we are all Melchizedek. Everyone, every race, every man and woman, every child, every level and every class, everybody, everybody is a Melchizedek priest. So we commune with you, Lord. Now say with me, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, I partake of your body, and I know that I'm part of your priesthood. I am leaving my past identity. I'm growing. I'm strengthening and being enlightened. I am fully entering into my priesthood and kingship. I am potent. I am able to reproduce the likeness of Christ. Every revelation, are you saying this with me? Every revelation brings me endurance. My breath, the cells in my body, every internal organ functions. My mind is whole. And I am made new in the priesthood of Melchizedek. In Jesus' name, I believe. Lord, we commune with you today. God, we thank you that you're expanding our understanding. That you're causing us to move into greater depths with you and greater heights with you. Lord, I thank you that we understand more and more how we are part of the unified bride that you're calling forward. And Father, in Jesus' name, we're thankful. Now take the cup in your hand. And taking the cup affirms our union with Christ as a partner. We are united you and me, not only with the crucified Christ, but with the risen Christ who is seated in heavenly places to whom we are joined. Now say this with me. Life is in your blood. Because of your shed blood, I have forgiveness and abundance. I have Zoe life flowing through me I have kingdom provision. You have removed the mistakes of my life. I stand boldly in your priesthood. And I hold your wisdom and your power and your authority. And today I rejoice and I participate in new understanding, and I celebrate my inheritance. I celebrate my inheritance of being a possessor of heaven and earth. I determine that I will possess what is mine to have. I will apprehend that which is given to me. I receive it now. I have divine perception and revelation I have understanding, and God, I thank you. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name.
Father, how we thank you. How we thank you for the priesthood that you've given us. Lord, that we enter into the new order. We set the old order aside and we begin to move toward that which you have intended for us from the very earliest part of our history in the Bible. God, we are returning to the Melchizedek idea of understanding that communion is an exchange, that tithing is an exchange, and it's a blessing. It's not grievous. It's not under the law anymore. We are set free from the law. And God, I thank you for everyone that is online today and everybody that will watch this video later. I have been looking at the stats on Facebook and there's actually thousands of people looking at this vid these videos that we have. And it doesn't look like it from here, but we're seeing a tremendous response in the, in the indicators. So I hope that you'll share this video. And, and message me and let me know what you think. And uh, would you consider sending a couple of friends the message, just a message about taking this communion with me, with a date and a time and a link to the right page? And happy birthday, Thea. Happy birthday. And, and join with me tomorrow. I'm really excited. I, I'm excited about how far we've come. We've had quite an incredible journey together. And I hope that you have uh, learned something today. I hope you'll let me know. I love you all so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you.